hear that. Hi, Kenny. Oh, my arm is killing me. That isn't going to fit, Kermit. We got we got too much money to spend, I guess, huh? You can, I'm sure they'll find you a spot. One, two, three, four, we're ready to go. Welcome everybody to the Land Use Committee meeting of Sioux Falls City Council. It's uh, the 26th of June, uh, 2012. Welcome to you visiting uh, and viewing us on channel 16 at home. Um, I'll call this meeting to order and ask that uh, we have a motion to approve the meetings of our last minute on May 29th, 2012. So, so moved, Karski. Second. All in, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Um, our first order of uh, business today is to talk, uh, talk about the Whittier uh, Heights project and the proposed TIF uh, for that. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> it says Good afternoon, that, uh, Brett counselors. is going to be there, but I guess you're going to you're going to handle it today, huh? Yeah, you get me. I hope you're not disappointed. No, not uh, yet. Brent, uh, Brent is here as well, and uh, so we'll make this a team effort if uh, if that's required. Um, I, I am going to speak just just briefly. Um, I think. All of you and, and the other counselors know that uh, with this project in particular, the Whittier Heights project and affordable housing, uh, a single family affordable housing development that's been proposed in the Whittier uh, neighborhood. Uh, this was a story uh, in the media recently, and I know many of you have been meeting, I, I believe, with, with uh, the developer and others involved in this in recent days and weeks. Um, We've been uh, working with uh, Mr. Dunham and his folks on this project as far as talking to them about the potential and the concept and so forth for some time now, which is pretty typical for, for any type of project that comes forward where it's requesting a TIF or something to that effect. Uh, but we did feel, given the timing of where this project, uh, proposed project is, the media story, that it would be, uh, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to bring it to this land use committee uh, that we knew was meeting at the end of the month here. And very candidly, I think, uh, as you know, we've been approving more TIFs the last couple of years for a variety of reasons, and we continue to get requests for TIFs, and uh, I see some of those, uh, some of that continuing. And I believe it may be a good practice for us to uh, bring these TIF requests and these TIF, uh, potential TIF projects to this committee. Um, if this is committee of choice, maybe it's a fiscal committee, but we thought land use was more appropriate. Uh, maybe this is a good idea to uh, bring these to a committee first as they go through the process. I don't know that we've done that with a, a previous TIF, but uh, I do think it may be a good idea. So, uh, what you're going to uh, hear today is uh, Adam Roach in our office is going to give just a very brief uh, presentation where he's going to hit the highlights of what we know uh, today about this uh, proposed project. And then we're going to transition from there to uh, uh, Todd Meyer Henry, I believe, and uh, possibly uh, Don Dunham and, and, uh, and his folks to go into more detail about the project um, and then to answer any questions. And so, uh, again, myself, Brent O'Neill from our office, Adam, and uh, the, uh, the developers, um, the developer team are here to answer any questions you have. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and let Adam get started here. Thank you, Darren. Good evening, Councilman, Mr. Organson. Today we're going to discuss the uh, Whittier Heights project um, proposal for... Uh, Tip number 16. The subject property is located off uh, North Cliff Avenue and uh, East First Street. A few of the project details. It's a proposed 80 unit rent to own housing uh, subdivision. Uh, total uh, approximate cost is about $12 million with a projected annual taxes of $170,000 a year. Uh, the developer is requesting city assistance in two forms. Uh, the first form is uh, TIF 
of course. Uh, the developer is requesting 1.85 million in tax increment over 15 years, uh, basically for the site work uh, due to uh, the blightedness defined by state statute. And uh, the purpose of this is basically leveling the playing field uh, for this site uh, versus those of green fields that are on the outskirts of town that are, are a bit more easy to, uh, to develop. Um, a few of the uh, elements of the TIF, uh, of course, is for blight removal. It's an uh, underutilized 29-acre parcel of land in the core. It's been vacant for several years. Uh, it used to have a, uh, some sort of packing plant on it, and it has recently been used by uh, Carlson Construction uh, for debris. Um, the site needs. The site has some uh, pretty challenging topography issues. Uh, it ranges about 70 feet from, uh, let's see, 13, 1,360 feet to 1,430 feet um, at, at different places uh, within the proposed development. Um, if you were to take a walk out there, it, it's very, very challenging. Um, some improvements include. Uh, connected, there would be a bit of connectivity to the south of the neighborhood that's adjacent to the south there and also to the, uh, the east there. Um, at the bottom there you see the proposed development and you can see the access on the south end and also on the east end into the Leaders Park edition. Uh, the second form of city assistance uh, that the developer is requesting is a uh, concerted plan and a concerted plan is being drafted. It's basically a plan that identifies uh, targeted areas uh, for redevelopment, and the plan must also uh, state a housing need. Uh, the plan also acts as a guideline uh, for development to enhance uh, different features of it, and this can include the design of the, the homes, uh, required street trees, uh, required green space, uh, and connectivity, and uh, those, those types of things. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome Todd Meyer Henry, representing Dunham Companies, to further explain the project and the scope. And after that, we'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Meyer Henry. It's good to be here. Um, this property, if you look at it, and I've thought about this a lot, uh, the property the last time dirt has actually been moved was probably in the 1880s when the two railroads came through and basically isolated this piece of property. And the reason it hasn't developed the 30.32 acres inside Sioux Falls is because of the drop in elevation, which made it difficult, and I think the access along cliff, which is very narrow, and those two items combined uh, did not promote any development in that area. Um, in addition to that, there's probably unknown uh, difficulties once you start digging up the ground around the falls. We, we run into granite, which, which increases the cost, as we found in the CNA project, and, and Sharapa both ran into those types of issues. So uh, this project will not be developed but for the assistance of South Dakota Housing and but for uh, a TIF uh, incentive which is provided by the city. Um, tax increment, as you know, is a process where first a uh, notice is published. Uh, it goes in front of the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission recommends creation to the governing body, sends it to the governing body at the regular hearing uh, when it's on the agenda. It's up to the discretion of the governing body to create the TIF. Uh, and they can, at that time, create the TIF and approve a plan that may be for them, be before them, or at a later date, uh, approve the plan. Um, and this project consists of 80 uh, rent-to-own homes. Uh, will be in the range of uh, 138000 to $162,000. Uh, the uh, purchase price at the end of 15 years will be 105000 to 110. But again, you have to remember that is dollars 15 years from now. So if you present value that to today's dollars, if, if uh, an owner could put away 77 or 75 to 77 thousand dollars today, they could buy that home. So we're really not talking about a purchase price of 110 uh, or 105. We're really talking about a purchase price today of 75 to 77 thousand uh, uh, dollars. The tax increment uh, would be used to uh, put in the infrastructure or, or assist in putting in the infrastructure and uh, handle the difficulties of developing this site. And I know I've talked to a number of you, so I think I should just open it up for qu any questions that have come up after this fact, and I or Don could answer those. Okay, thank you. Um, you might as well wait right there. We'll see if there's any questions from the, from the committee.
No questions? Okay, Mr. Karski. You really don't know what's under the ground here, how deep it is, what, what it's gonna take. I'm, I'm looking at the topography map and we don't have any engineer reports yet. Okay, I'm, I'm you know looking at the topography topography map and looking at where you would kind of rough out your street design. Going to the outside, all the homes would be lower than the street level, according to the way this looks. Um, no problems anticipated with drainage, that type of thing out here. I would leave that up to an engineer, and obviously the city engineers, because all public infrastructure improvements have to be. Uh, passed over by the city engineers first to make sure that it fits into the city sewer water and, and street storm sewer Other questions again, again oh. and that's a conceptual drawing until they right. actually get out there and put some Some holes in the ground to figure out what's under it Mr. Staggers. Yes, uh, Todd um, There is one person who's contacted me who lives in that area and they're against this and the reason they're against it is because they're concerned their property values are going to go up. Uh, how do you respond to something like that? <laughs> I don't know if I can on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that, then, this person was very, very concerned about that. But. Well, I would respond that even though property values may go up, that doesn't necessarily mean that their assessed valuation for taxation would go up. Right. Uh, it takes a little more than just some new housing in a next door, mm -hmm. next neighborhood to uh, to increase your house value. Uh, some of the old neighborhoods like uh, uh, that had new homes go in, the older homes did not experience, uh, if you had a $150,000 house and a, a million dollar mansion, McMansion was built next to you, their home values historically have not gone up to half a million dollars. They've stayed original, just the way our assessor works. Okay, I'll refer them to you then. On this. And I can give them <laughs> examples. <laughs> Todd, a um, couple of questions if no one else has a question. Oh, Mr. Anderson. Yes, Mr. Meyer Henry. Um, this would be the first time that uh, Sioux Falls has ever used a TIF for single family housing? For single family, yes. Right. Um, could you tell us or give us a brief uh, history of the changes that the state has made to allow this to happen? Well, last year uh, in July, uh, well, I guess it went back a little further than that. I've, I've worked with Aberdeen, Brookings, uh, a lot of communities across the state with tax increment financing, with affordable housing projects. And what it came down to it was uh, a little difficult under the existing stat tax increment statute, which was a remnant of the early 1970s to move into and, and do some of the projects the way everybody would like to see them done. And so last year went into effect, we, we changed a number of things. One, um, you used to have blight. Uh, this, this site here has blight under the statute. Uh, it's probably uh, uh, has obsolete zoning. It's I-2 and it, I-2 in the middle of residential housing and it has uh, crime, uh, probably unsanitary conditions due to the fact that we have people who have a lifestyle choice want to live in the trees on the north side of the site, so that, that qualifies as blight. But even if it didn't qualify as blight, the new statute put into effect that if 50% or more of the project would create economic development, you could create a tax increment district for economic development. So it would qualify as, as either. Uh, in addition to that, what came up was uh, a substantial amount of projects in tax increment um, communities and counties wanted to provide incentives that were not necessarily public infrastructure incentives. They wanted to provide maybe some money for job training once the companies came in or um, a number of other uh, issues that would come up uh, that they'd want to provide incentives, a grant, just a, just a, a, a grant for hiring or some other things. And so the statute was changed to allow uh, a valid project cost as a grant. And a grant is just that. You can give it, you could tie it with a developer's agreement to a specific uh, task that you wanted them to do. Uh, and and it, it made it very flexible for a lot of economic development uh, entities in these cities to try to promote uh, their cities. 
before we, we had it, it was, uh, we went through it, it was called a land acquisition grant. In the statute, you could buy their land, and then the city had the power to sell it, so they'd turn around and sell it back to them for a dollar. And so when I testified at, at the legislature, I said, why don't we just make this straightforward, and we're doing it right now, and it will open up, uh, like Mitchell had a lot of interest to provide uh, training for welders and those things, and they could promote promote that through training and use tax increment to help train new employees. So those are the, the two key changes. And if I may? Yes, ma <clears throat> After the uh, newspaper article, I think there was a lot of confusion on how this TIF would be utilized. Uh, could you explain that also because I don't believe we can use TIF for actual buildings. Yeah, the TIF, uh, the statute remained the same. Uh, as I say, you can't use for the sticks in the house. You can't put any tax increment revenue into the house. So it has to go elsewhere. And in, in this instant case, it would go into uh, the infrastructure and the grading, the, the old statute provisions, which, which are, it goes into the dirt that surrounds it, the streets, the curbs, the gutters, the water the sewer, the, the infrastructure improvements. Thank you. Any other? Then I have a couple, if I could. Um, don't know where to start here. Uh, you would uh, form some park land and things like that in there into this uh, also, I, I assume? That is correct. And, and again, that's city planning mm -hmm. and zoning that we would be doing all that with as part of that good um, I, I, any concern with being that close to the railroad well um, there are a number of tests that have to be done with the railroad with regards to uh, federal monies that are coming in through South Dakota housing so there will be some studies as to noise and setbacks from okay. the railroad do you have some information on that mr. Dunham Thank you, Don Dunham. Uh, Commissioner Rolfing, I would just, uh, or Councilman, I would just prefer if, if 65 decibels is the max that you can get. The one benefit of this site is because we don't have any horns or whistles from the train, which usually are the loudest part about the train. And so, uh, so that's one thing. But, uh, but if, if there is more than a 65 decibel rating, we can either do two things. We can mitigate it with fences, trees, uh, berms, that sort of thing, or we can build the house uh, 85 feet, I think, from the back of the house to the edge of the railroad track. Not, and nothing to do with right-of-ways or lot lines, it's the distance between the actual train track and the back of the house. And so we actually have got another layout. It doesn't look exactly like this because it looks a little goofier, but, but where we can move that away. Okay from the track. So we, we think we're in good shape on that. Good. But it's about $4,000 for a, a decibel uh, deal. We, till unless we got our TIF approved, we didn't want to spend the 4000 Since Mike, Mike Cooper bought this project to us a year and a half ago, we've, uh, we've been struggling to get to this point. Just stay there. I have a okay. couple other for you. Thank because you. I kind of like this concept, because I, we're taking a blighted area, as, I, as I've seen. And, and probably a very beautiful part of Sioux Falls if you look at the trees that are back in there. Yeah. And you could see some, some um, a nice little concept going in back in there. Um, but I would like to know uh, a couple of things about this rent to own. Um, what's the rent going to be? Well, that's determined by South Dakota Housing Authority okay. and the fair market uh, rent uh, by the low income housing office in Sioux Falls. So that's dictated to us. And normally, though, uh, we, we have three of these projects like this now that we've done over the last 15 years. And uh, the mo one that got the most notoriety was Homestead Trails, which is like a mile east of this. And believe it or not, that was, it's hard to believe it was 16 or 17 yeah. years ago. But now we're selling them, and we've got 29 of the 32 sold, and the other ones is just a matter of getting them the paperwork done, and they're all going to be sold. But uh, and we sold those for $60,000 a house. Like Todd was saying, you know, uh, over years of time, that that's a great value. Those most of those homes are appraising between 120 and 150 thousand dollars. Just to give you a reference on that. And then the other question I had down here is, are they are they being sold to the original owners? Well, absolutely, but even but if, but if the original owner moves out, because during that $8,000 tax credit deal of 
President Obama's two or three years ago, a lot of people didn't want to wait for their home, so they went out and bought homes with that $8,000 tax credit. And also, if you're in the inner city, you can get up to five dollars or $6,000 from the Community Development Office. So you, they were picking up for it, and, and that's a zero interest deferred, deferred grant to the buyer until they sell the property. So, I mean, th those were nice boosts to people who wanted to live in the inner city. But the, uh, but anyway, the point I was gonna make is, is that, that I think that uh, you gotta live there five years total or you do have a recapture. In other words, if you bought, and we've sold a couple of them when the people weren't living there and they know they've got to live there for five years or they've got to pay a recapture when they sell it. It stops people from trying to invest, you know. But okay. again, there's tough requirements to, to qualify. But I think it's the, at the 15 year, it's the, whoever's leasing it has the option. Has the option. But right. if somebody's living there, if somebody bought it from somebody else and they live there five years, they can then get this, in that deal, the $60,000 deal. Absolutely. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to know. Um, any, okay, that answer that I brought up some more questions. <laughs> uh, com Councilor Anderson. Also, uh, there's been some questions on the size of the homes, the number of bathrooms, bedrooms, things like that. Could you uh, comment on how that's dictated also? Yes, that's dictated to us by South Dakota Housing Authority and the program. We don't have any control if, in other words, you have to have a minimum of three bedrooms and, and you have to have two bathrooms. I mean, that's just the rules. And, but, but again, we didn't actually create this program 15, 16 years ago when we started Homestead Trails. We actually took this program from, a, I think it was in Idaho, where they, is the only rent-to-own program that had been done in the United States. But South Dakota, and I'm getting a little bit off track, but South Dakota Housing Authority agrees. This is the best housing alternative for a young family. And I also would like to make this comment that right now, most uh, our demographic set you know, the, the most uh, prevalent what person is a single woman with two or three or four children. I mean, that's the people that are renting these. Okay. And South Dakota Housing has been experimenting with tax increment and affordable housing. I was just in Coleman, I think I mentioned with some of the meetings. Coleman created a tax increment district for affordable housing so people could move into community. I was actually there on a, a water project last night and I brought it up and asked them about how their project went. Um, and they did fill them up. So, I mean, if a community like Coleman uh, can, can fill the lots up, they used it a little differently, and South Dakota Housing's done it in Brookings, too. Those all filled up because Brookings was short of affordable housing. All around this range, it cost to build, quote, unquote, affordable housing. And, and the only thing, we would not need this TIF if we could qualify for the 9% uh, tax credits. We're asking for the 4% tax credits because all the 9% are controlled by Citibank, the Catholic Church, Costello's, and all those nonprofits that are being formed in most of these inner city, middle cities across South Dakota. So with that, we'll never get approval, and South Dakota Housing Authority tells us we'll never get approval. So that's why we tried to come up with a program. We've met with Mark Lousing, the South Dakota Housing Authority person, a couple of times, and we have came up with a bond program that they can take us through with the 4% tax credits. We're working with our bonding company out of Boston, Massachusetts. So, and, and so this is the only program that we can get to work in Sioux Falls for the rent to own. Super. One more, Mr. Karski. We talk a lot about affordable housing in Sioux Falls and making housing available to a lot of under, underserved people in our community. And it, not only for rent, but to own. There's a lot of pride in ownership when somebody can own a piece of property. And I commend you on this project and looking for something. And, and actually the neighborhood is very good for the people that, you know, the working class of our community for them to get to their work and so forth. Um, if you're looking for somebody to make a motion to move this to the full council, I would do that. I don't know what date you're thinking, but I would. Make I would. That motion. Uh, I would entertain that kind of motion. Would there be a second? Second. Okay. Um, then we'd have some discussion, uh, Councilor Anderson. Um, uh, one for Darren Smith now. <laughs> Get him under. Yeah. Thank sure. you, gentlemen. Appreciate it very much. 
Darren, there's been a lot of questions and discussion over what is affordable housing in our city. We've even done a housing study to try to answer those questions, and it's, it's still something that is you know, just outside the grasp because it depends on the location and what the plan is. Uh, with our housing replacement program, mm -hmm. what can this, what is the city building a house for and what are we selling it, calling it affordable? Yeah, well, I think what you have to understand with that program, and, and I would say over the last 10 years, our program, uh, the Neighborhood Revitalization Program in Community Development has built and sold approximately 50 homes. They're looking, uh, Dunham is looking at doing 80, approximately 80 homes in this single development. Um, in terms of our Neighborhood Revitalization Program, I think what what you have to keep in mind and people need to understand is we do get federal funds to support what we're doing with that and many other programs. We, we do use a very small amount of local dollars, but there is a significant investment required. Uh, I can tell you uh, for a typical home that uh, all costs associated and you have to start at the beginning of acquiring a dilapidated home. So keep in mind, we're not out there proactively looking for vacant lots or empty lots to build a new home and sell it to an income qualifying family. We first start by searching for dilapidated and oftentimes condemned homes that uh, are really bringing a neighborhood down, have the potential to become a cancer in a neighborhood that we know spreads. Those are what we're looking for. We will acquire those properties as cheaply as we can and we do get them very reasonably oftentimes. Um, we will maintain that site for as much as one or two years. There are costs associated with that. Um, then we will build a home, including a basement. Um, they'll be reasonably sized, oftentimes around 1,200 square feet, give or take, with an unfinished basement. Uh, when it's all said and done, typically you'll have, uh, we'll have between 150 to 175 thousand dollars in a home. And we have a policy, we will not sell our homes for more than $120,000 for a few reasons. One, because they are for income qualifying individuals. Some of that is driven by the federal rules uh, and other rules with the dollars we use. And, and again, we want them to be within reach of income qualifying families, which is typically 80% of the median family value or less. Um, so you can look at the gap uh, you can see what that gap is, and it is somewhat significant, but that's the investment you make. And the alternative uh, is to do nothing. And um, I would argue that if you do nothing, you'll spend the same amount of money, probably a lot more, but you'll spend it instead of in preventive measures, which is what we engage in, you'll spend it in treatment, treating the cancers. Uh, you'll be spending a lot more in code enforcement, um, and those activities, uh, you'll spend the money. This is one of those classic treat, uh, prevention versus treatment issues, I think. So the city will incur those costs and make those investments, but you'll be treating with code enforcement and other things instead of prevention and revitalizing neighborhoods. If I could, just one other thing I would add quickly on this, and I think you guys know this, um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, with this as a TIF, so removing the other, the other elements, as a TIF, we've started to see these, you know, some of the TIF requests in these projects are not your classic cookie cutter TIFs that maybe we've seen in years past where they've all been pretty straightforward and all been downtown. And I think it is important things have changed clearly and we're going to see with some TIF requests that I think are potentially on the horizon that are like this one, unique. Uh, I would also say the last one that was approved, the Sanford Sports Complex, was unique. So at the end of the day, these are policy decisions. As uh, Todd Meyer Henry said, uh, with many of these, it really isn't a question of do they qualify in terms of state law. Uh, that's our job to make sure you, you folks know all those things and obviously we never support something that is not in compliance with the statutes with TIF. But these really are policy decisions. You are talking in this case about an area that is, uh, uh, well, blight is a very broad, uh, has a very broad uh, and subjective definition. But I think you can make an argument it is a blighted property. There are extraordinary costs with grading this site. As far as the but for in area developing, 
With this one, it hasn't developed for decades. So you could certainly make the case. Now, having said that, I also want to say the flip side of that uh, is we have not done a TIF in Sioux Falls, to the best of my knowledge, for single-family residential. Um, uh, we have not been in the habit of approving TIFs outside of those defined down, downtown boundaries. Now, we have recently in the last one to two years a couple, um, but this would be outside those boundaries, but yet in the core and in Whittier neighborhood, which I think a past city council has said Whittier and Pettigrew would be neighborhoods they would consider TIF projects for. So you'll have to wrestle with these as they make their way through the process, um, and I think there will be more to come. Thank you. In uh, typical Darren fashion, he answered that first question elongated. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm trying to be informative. Said, I think he said about 120000 Was the sale was price. Was the sale price. But what's yeah. the price? Yes. What, Darren? <laughs> yes. The price to build again? Well, you ha again, you have to have all ex to build. Just give me an average Actually price. building is a hundred, approximately 120000 Right. So we will build them and sell them for typically about the same amount. That's money in, money out. Where we have to make the investment is in acquiring the dilapidated property, maintaining it for one or two years, and all those associated site costs. And that's where I think there are some misunderstandings. Councilor Sagers. Yeah, Darren, just to clarify, the, the 50 houses that the city has been involved in, we've lost money on every one of them. Well, uh, I would say we've made investments uh, in, in the neighborhood in each of those projects. That goes back to the conversation we had earlier, uh, what one will call a loss, others will call an investment. Um, <laughs> Most people who invest money, if they lose money, it's a bad investment. So well, we've had ba 50 bad investments. I think, uh, well, Councilor Staggers, you have to understand, I think that's how the for-profit uh, world would look at it. Uh, we're not uh, the private sector. Um, and again, I'd tell you, and, and I mean this very, very respectfully, my personal opinion is that to look at those as losses is, is truly a short-sighted view because you will spend those dollars. You will. Taxpayers will. But you'll spend it on the back end treating cancers in neighborhoods. And I think it's a lot more expensive and you have run down neighborhoods instead of being preventive. Over here, Mr. Karski. I'm just doing some math here, and I think you said 50 homes over the yeah, last Yeah, approximately. Years? Yep, okay. over the last 10, and give or take. And if we invested 50,000 yep. per home times 50, that's two and a half million. The cost for this TIF, I believe, is about one million seven over so many years, and we're getting 80 homes. It seems to be pretty good math and a very good investment. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we're looking at with our program is not only how we've done it historically, how we want to do it going forward, and these types of uh, public-private partnerships uh, as a different way to do it. Yeah. Councilor Anderson. Yeah, uh, just a response to Councilman Staggers, too. I think we have to take a look at these 50 homes or the 80 homes as an investment in our older neighborhoods, something I have pushed since I've become a councilman we take a look at our older neighborhoods and we want to make sure that we keep them at a certain level or actually try to rebuild those neighborhoods so that we don't lose them. Then, our, then the cost of losing a neighborhood could be 10 times the amount of just investing in these older neighborhoods. So I think that our housing replacement program has been an investment in our older neighborhoods and has shown that when a, a new replacement house is put on a block, you come back six months later, you'll see that whole block uh, brighten, yeah. you know, improvements made. So I see that as an investment in our older neighborhoods. Yeah, if I could uh, kind of respond. Yes. I, th I think Mr. most Chase. of this is what we're talking about here is just simply anecdotal information. Mm -hmm. There's no studies. It, it's hoped that we're really improving the city by losing all this money on these 50 houses, but we really don't know. We have a motion on the floor to um, bring this to the full, bring this uh, TIF to the full council. Uh, I would, uh, the first time we can bring that is uh, July 10th. Um, I would... Uh, Ask for a, a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 
All opposed? Motion carries. And I thank you very much, uh, all of you. Thank you. We have uh, one more agenda item, and that is uh, to talk about uh, the, oh, thank you, Tamara. Uh, all of you in the, uh, in the meeting in, the, uh, in Carnegie today, I would urge you to or ask you to sign in before you, uh, before you leave today um, and make sure that you, uh, you do sign in so that we know who is here. And, uh, well, that's just what we do here. So if you do uh, have something to say or we are, we are talking to you, we know who, uh, who has talked, et cetera. Um, the, we have one more thing on our agenda, um, and that is the, uh, the, the visit to, to visit and start the discussion on, um, between us on the um, uh, dogs uh, situation, which was brought up at our last meeting and, um, by Councilor Karski. And would you like to... Uh, start that discussion a little bit more right now and then we can uh, take it from there? I sure would. Um, first I wanna, I'm sure, welcome all of the fellow counselors for the about 100 emails that we received here in the last <laughs> week uh, regarding this subject. I know they went to all of you. And, um, and the emails address both sides of the issue and most people, most people were very informative. And um, while I probably haven't changed my thought about um, the subject, I, it has opened and broadened my perspective and I am willing to consider a whole lot more options. And I think, I feel that what we first need to do before we talk about any sort of registrations or bans or anything like that is talk about our current um, dog laws, how we define vicious animals, um, fines for not controlling animals, and probably start the discussion and focus it on what we currently have. I would agree uh, wholeheartedly, and um, Councillor Staggers. Yeah, I guess uh, I'm wondering where's the problem that we have. Um, when I was in the state senate and peer, I remember on one occasion we had legislation introduced and eventually passed because of one incident where somebody was interfering with somebody's guide dog, you know, they were acting like a jerk, you know? And uh, we passed a law making it a crime to interfere with a guide dog because of one incident. And this is a concern that I have here. Where's the problem? Do we have one, two, three incidents? Uh, I think we ought to see if we really have a problem before we deal with this. And I, I would, hmm? if you don't mind, yeah, and I would agree and I, I only brought it up because I was approached by three people in the last four months. One was a neighbor constituent um, who was bit um, while walking on a street. Uh, another one owns a property who um, has people moving into her next door that is doing a dog rescue. Um, the third one would have been the recent attack in a city park by a dog. And there's a difference between a dog bite and an attack. And we've seen this come up quite several times over the years. And if we have dogs, or it, and it's, I'm going to probably change the way I word that. If we have people who aren't controlling their animals and other people getting hurt because of it, a little bit of a pun here, we need to put a little more teeth into the laws that we have to control animals. So that's where I would like to go with this. And I think that's the purpose of our committee here. But once again, I mean, I remember several years ago, I was out campaigning. I got bit by a dog that I didn't run to the council saying, we gotta take a look at this very serious issue because there was no serious issue. And once again, I'm still wondering, do we really have a serious issue? And where we're gonna start coming up with regulations and rules and, and all of this kind of stuff. Well, I think uh, I'll take charge right here. And I think what we're gonna do on this, uh, uh, Councilor Staggers and and uh, Anderson and, and Karski, as I said in an email to you, is I think what we need to do is let's get some experts in here and tell us uh, what the facts and figures are. If we do have a problem, number one. If we do have a problem, then let's deal with it. If we don't have a problem, then we can, then we can drop it and we know we don't have a problem. So what I would like to do is ask, um, uh, get your help uh, on some people that we'd like to bring before us um, that we think would give us the statistics for Sioux Falls as to whether or not we have a problem. 
uh, and who we'd like to hear from so that we know we've got the, the correct um, uh, answers, uh, statistics, if you will, so that we know. So if you can help me so that we can uh, ask them to come before us at our next meeting or the whenever that's going to be, and uh, then we can, we'll know whether we have a problem and then we can deal with it from that standpoint. Would that make sense to everybody? And if I could start, I yes. guess I would like from our city attorney a very detailed, uh, we all have been forwarded the current ordinance, but how, how often is it enforced? I mean, how is it enforced? I look at the definition there of who determines an animal is vicious and I, Quite frankly, in the de definition of a vicious animal, I think we need to work on that. Okay. So I, I think from our city attorney, we city need attorney's his perspective. Office. Okay. I would, I, and we can go ahead. Rex, I think we also need to include uh, animal control. I mean, they are the people who deal directly with uh, with the animals. Okay. Uh, the Humane Society should Humane be included Society. on that. Good. And in the emails that we received, uh, we received emails from several people who have uh, dog rescues. I think that that those voices also need to be heard. Dog rescues. And I think there's there's probably as are they going to be said, uh, experts on this situation? Are they going to be um, are they going to be able to give us facts and figures, or are they going to be more of a? Um, this is more than facts and figures. This is, this is basically what we're discussing, not only uh, is there a problem, but we're also going to be discussing how to, uh, how to address a problem if there is one that needs to be addressed. But that would be the and, second step, okay. Commissioner or Counselor. Let's find out if we have a problem. If we have a problem, then let's bring those people in and talk to them at that point. Would, that, that was my that thought. That would be fine with would me that as long as they are included yeah. if, if we decide there is an issue. Exactly, okay. exactly. Um, how about, um, do we need the police department here to find out? Is well, that, or is that part of the animal control? That's part of animal control. Okay. Um, Mr. Staggers, can you think of anyone else? No, I think that uh, Dean and uh, Kenny have covered just about everybody. Okay. If either or any of you think of something else before that time mm -hmm. or before the next one, um, then we have one more um, added agenda item, uh, if I will, or open discussion, and that is um, our next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, July 31st. Um, on that day, we have a budget hearing that's scheduled from 3 to 6. Would you, um, we should have some other agenda items coming up, uh, the chamber or the uh, country club issue, uh, a number of other ones that are coming. Would you like to entertain a different day for that, for our meeting, like uh, something like that, or would you like to move it till August? Um, I, I think we're getting, we're going to start, if we don't hold it, um, we're going to be in trouble. So should we just plan on holding it after the budget hearing at 6 o'clock? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking 6 o'clock's a little late. Um, how about the 30th, just doing it on a Monday? Is that, a, is that well, available? Well, that's kind of what I was thinking. Uh, Tamara, can you help us with this? Whatever. Would, would that? Whatever the committee decides. Well, let's go at 7 o'clock in the morning then. On <laughs> Denise will be here. <laughs> Denise will be here. <laughs> um, Monday, July 30th, would that be a problem for any of the other council members? Is that a problem for? Not at this time, it's not. Okay. Then uh, I'll uh, move the, uh, uh, the uh, Land Use Committee to uh, Monday the 30th at uh, 4 at the regular time, 4 o'clock at this time, uh, here in the Council Chambers. Do I hear anything from uh, our legislative research? Okay. Um, we will do that, and we will um, try to get the, the people that we have uh, on our agenda that are on our list here, a city attorney person to talk about the ordinance and definition, animal control person, and uh, someone from the Humane Society be uh, in front of us at that time along with our other agenda items. Councilor yeah. Staggers. Yeah, first. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I was just wondering if, if there's uh, any suggestions from the audience as far as people we might have come in. Um, okay. Hold on one minute. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. 
kind of along the same line as Councillor Staggers, I guess we do have some very, very interested people here, some passionate people with what we have going on. And I'm going to encourage you to keep the communication, the lines coming. I read all the emails. I'd like to respond to all of them. Um, some of them have a common theme through them. So I, I have received a lot of very good ideas. Yep. So um, keep the ideas coming. Like I said, I, I will keep an open mind. So, um, and if you do have suggestions on anybody that we may include inside of our discussion, just to get this topic going, to see where we need to go, if we need to go anywhere, let's talk about it. And, and I feel the same way. I have a very open mind on this. I've had some really good emails and I try to get back on all of them. What I will entertain right now is if you have someone else you think should be incorporated into our list of people that we should listen to, I will entertain um, that uh, telling us who that person should be and we'll, we'll entertain that, but that's all. Um, the reason I'm doing it this way, folks, is because we could listen to hours and hours of testimony. Let's get the, we need the facts first, and then we'll, we'll see the rest. And I, I'm seeing people shake their heads yes out there, so I appreciate your willingness to go along with us on this. Are there any other, um, if someone would like to come up and think there's somebody else that we should be talking to at our meeting in, in July, um, please identify yourself and give us um, who that is and why. Uh, just a quick, quick. A name? Corey Beatty, and I'm the executive director of the Sioux Falls Humane Society. I just wanted to bring forth to the council that I'd like to have these other people that are interested. We can have a meeting up at the Humane Society for any and all comments if they like, um, and I would be open to that if that's what you approve. And then we can um, kind of get everybody that we would think would be involved and then maybe bring it forth to you as a, as a leader. Or you may send me an email. Okay. And uh, we could bring it that way. This thank may you. be a stopping point um, be at fine. the Humane Society. Super. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. One, just one other thing, if Mr. I Anderson. could just make a brief comment, especially to the people here in the crowd, that uh, I understand your concerns, and uh, I just want to let you know that thank you for the emails again, and I also, for a very long time, owned an animal that would probably be on this list. I had a wolf hybrid for 15 years, and uh, I actually helped raise his parents. So I understand the concerns, and uh, we, we will get this worked out. I, I think it's something that, you know, with, the, with your involvement, we will come up with something if there is a problem. Thank you. Very well put, uh, Councilor Anderson. Um, any other, anything else for the good of the uh, committee? I will uh, adjourn the committee then. Thank you, Jim.